All right. So this is the second class. Uh, we'll be covering the simplest self-cleaning circuit that uh, there is, um, which is a uh, cycle of inverters. And so self time circuits, they're, bi they're built to not have any external clock, which means that fundamentally they need to be, there we go. They need to be, uh, they need to operate without that clock. So the simplest circuit is three inverters. We reset the circuit in some state. Let's just call it R down, A down, and E up. Um, we have three wires, but you'll notice that uh, because there are three gates and because CMOS logic is inverting, this state is unstable. It will, it will not stay in that state. And in particular, this uh, gate right here um, is currently transient, right? So it will seek to change the value of R in order to uh, uh, make sure that R is the inverse of A, right? So if A is zero, uh, then R should be one. So we're immediately going to move out of this reset state. Now, the on the on the right here, uh, we're showing uh, a control flow language specification for self time circuits. Uh, it, the form shown here is called handshake expansions or HSE. Uh, it is the next level up from production rules in abstraction. And so this is basically just saying R is reset low in parallel with E is reset high in parallel with A is reset low. Uh, the semicolon is a, um, a composition operator that says, uh, you know, sequential. So do this, then do that. Um, and so we're specifying the reset state here. And uh, then in order to uh, run the circuit, the next gate, this gate will drive R from zero to one. And so this is the next transition that happens. But now this gate is unstable, right? This gate is transient. Um, and so it'll try to drive E low. And so after R is driven high, then E transitions low. And this continues to happen, right? So then A transitions high, then R transitions low, then E transitions high, and so on. Now, because this is a cycle, this will just repeat uh, forever, right? And so there's a, uh, a syntax in handshaking expansions um, for an infinite loop, a while loop, which is basically uh, a star bracket and then a, a closed bracket around the end. So this basically says reset the state as follows, then uh, forever do these transitions over and over and over again, these six transitions. Um, now, if we were to try to think about self time circuits uh, without modules, without, you know, dividing up into, into sections that we could then black box, and we'd have a lot of trouble uh, kind of thinking about these large circuits. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take this circuit, we're going to divide it up into two, two processes. The one on the left um, talks to the one on the right over this, over these two wires, R and E. Now, A is internal to the green process, which means that uh, it is not visible from the outside world. Um, the green process could be implemented any way that we want. It could be four inverters or it could be six inverters. And all of those internal signals are ultimately don't matter to the outside world. And so for this expression, we can just ignore A. And it represents the same circuit. Right, so A disappears and we have R is set low, E is set high. And then we loop forever, R goes up, E goes down, R goes down, E goes up. And that's just looking at the two signals across this, this boundary. Um, now we can look at what happens if we want to describe just the uh, behavior of the circuit on the left, not knowing anything about the circuit on the right. Um, right now we're just describing kind of active transitions. So we're driving R up, we're driving E low, we're driving R down, we're driving E high. But 
if we want to describe just a single process, then we need to be able to wait for input signals coming in from other processes, right? And so we can think about E as being driven by the red process. And therefore, instead of for the green process, instead of driving E, since it doesn't own E, it will wait for a given transition on E. So for the green process, R is reset low, and then we wait for E to be reset high. And then uh, we infinitely loop, driving R up, and then waiting for E to be tra to transition low, and then driving R down, and then waiting for E to transition high. Right, and so this, this syntax, the, the bracket, is effectively a condition, it's a guard. Um, which basically just says, wait for this state to be true, or wait for this subsection of state to be true. Similarly, if we look at the red process and try to describe its behavior um, separate of the behavior of the green, then the red process will need to wait for transitions on R and drive transitions on E. And so it'll wait for R to be low and then drive, drive E high in the reset phase. Then uh, over the course of its, its its lifetime, it'll loop indefinitely and wait for R to be high, driving low, wait for R to be low, and then drive E high. So we have these two processes now, two separate descriptions. So we have the, the description for the green process operating in parallel with the description for the red process. And these two processes are talking over this channel. Uh, and R can be thought of as the request, and E can be thought of as the enable, right? So when you want to send information over the channel, the green process raises the request to a valid value. And then when the red process is done with that information, then it lowers the enable saying, all right, I've processed the information, you can reset the channel. Uh, then you get into the reset phase of the channel where the green process uh, resets the request, and then the, the red process resets the enable saying, all right, you can send data over the channel again. Um, so this is HFC on the right. Uh, it is a kind of Boolean level description of the circuit in control flow language rather than, than a data flow language. So production rules are like a, a straight up one-to-one -one mapping to the circuit. They're a data flow language. HFC, the control flow language, is not a one-to-one -one mapping. You have to compile from one to the other. Uh, and again, this, is, this symbol represents parallel. These two things are operating in parallel. So we can draw back a box around this channel uh, and call it C. So now we have C.R and C.E. And the green process, uh, we can kind of add some syntactic sugar to get to the language called CHP, or communicating hardware processes. Uh, CHP is derived from uh, Anthony Hoare's CSP, communicating sequential processes, uh, which is actually what Go was derived from. And so we have in the green process a send on C, uh, and then in the red process we receive on C. And on the left, the green process represents a source, and the red process a sync. So, any questions? So, what you said back in the beginning, it's the simplest, like asynchronous circuit. Yep. So. Um, is there a reason why it's like three inverters, why that's the simplest and not say like one or two? Yeah, so um, a single inverter, the there isn't enough delay between the input and output to actually have a kind of steady but unstable state, transient state. It'll just kind of uh, stabilize at 0 0.5 volts across the circuit. Um, just because the delay is too low. Okay, so kind of like constantly moving. So we're yeah. Back, so um, two inverters is a latch, and it is uh, it holds a value. Okay. 
right? Because any even number of inverters holds a value uh, stable on that set of inverters. Okay. There we go. Any other questions? Before we jump in? Okay. So let's take a look at the examples. We're going to jump into lecture two. Uh, and It's of course lecture two. So in this section, we have just the one example that we saw in lecture. Uh, we have the source and the synth, and we're going to be uh, connecting them up over the channel C. The the type of the channel is called E one on one. We will get to why it's called that later, um, but. For right now, it's just a dataless channel. Like the previous um, examples that we saw, we have the imports, globals, but we've added channels.act. I will show, that, show you that in a minute. We have our two process definitions. We have the source uh, with the globals and the channel C. It has an internal variable, A, that we talked about. Uh, then we have the production rule body, which we'll fill in with the sort, with the uh, source rail BDD and the ground rail uh, GMD. Then we have the sync. It has the, the globals input again and the channel that we connect over. Again, it has the production rule body with BDD and ground. Finally, we instantiate everything with globals, the channel C, and then the source and the sync. And we connect them up over the channel C here and here. In channels.act, uh, we define the E101 channel with the request and enable wires defined here. So bool R and bool E. Globals look the same. And then E1.RC uh, looks roughly the same. We set C.E to 1 for the reset state, and then we advance 100. To run the circuit. So let's take a look at E1. So if we look back at our example here, we have the let's go back to here. We have the source and the sync, the source on the left, the sync on the right. And so the the sync is just going to be a single inverter. So let's do that. It's an inverter from C dot R to C dot E. So C dot R, C dot E down, not C dot R, C dot E up. Then if we look at the source on the channel, we have two inverters, one from C dot E to C A. So C dot E, C A down, not C dot E, C A up, and one from C A to C dot R. So C A, C dot R up or down, not C A, C dot R up. Does that make sense so far? As a syntactic note, full C A is not indexing inside of C, it's just its own. Correct on CA, but because we've defined under uh, channel.act the two rules R and E within the channel construct C, yes, then we have to do the indexing syntax. Yes, we can, I can make that a little bit more explicit by just removing the C from this. It's just a variable name. Mm -hmm. And A here is an internal variable because in our two processes, uh, it's not visible to the sync process. Correct. 
when we try to represent this in PRS, uh, is there any other place we could put that pool A, that internal variable? We can put it anywhere outside the PRS body and inside the process definition. Okay. So, although it wouldn't necessarily be uh, true to the circuit we're trying to design, would that A have been defined inside of global, inside of a channel to act? Could it be one of our globally defined it variables? It could be. It'd be a little weird because you'd be looking at an internal variable of a process. So it'd be improperly scoped in that respect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, you can look at variables that are internal to a process and build events around it. Um, but you you break a um, a formalism that makes it easy to guarantee correctness, functional correctness, and so you have to be very careful about maintaining that functional correctness because you're breaking your process or boundaries or process boundaries. So for someone coming from a more uh, software programming side of things, this is not exactly lexical scope, but we're employing lexical scope to mimic the uh, what the different hardware uh, circuits can see of each other. Right. Yeah, you really, uh, you can think of processes as a function that is constantly running, has a, has a main loop, okay. right? Okay. So we have this written. We're going to save it, quit, and we're going to call make. Now, before it's run all the commands, and we can take a look at what it produces. And so we have e1.prs, and we have the folder e1. e1.prs is for the digital simulation, and the folder e1 is for the analog. So let's take a look at e1.prs. Again, we have a whole bunch of aliases for different names of different signals. Uh, but then we have the production rules for our sync here. And we have the production rules for our source here. They've all been flattened from the uh, act bodies that we wrote in our act file. So we can call prsim e1.prs. And then we call source e1.rc. And as you can see, once, so after reset, um, c.r and c.e and the internal variable a oscillate um, with, now because timing is random, it doesn't have an exact cycle time in the digital simulation. The random timing helps identify failure modes in the cell time circuit. But this continues forever, so if we were just to say cycle, it just goes. And then control C will interrupt. And so we can see what that might look like in the analog simulation. So we look at, we go into E1. Uh, again, we have our dot dot spy and we have our uh, test dot spy and m dot PRS. The main thing that's changed between this and the previous examples is dot dot spy. So let's take a look at that. Um, and so we have our uh, source and the sync seems to be isolated. So the sync in this, um, analog simulation is isolated to the uh, digital simulation part side of the simulation, right? The digital side of the simulation. So if we go ahead and simulate, we call PRSIM uh, env.prs source PRSIM.rc. And it runs through quite a few transitions uh, on all of those variables. Go ahead and quit. We now have test.spy.prn, and we can call PR view test.spy.prn to take a look at the result. We have three variables, the request, the enable, and we have an internal variable, A. And so you can see the uh, enable, which is driven by the sync, is being driven by the digital side of the simulation. So it has very clean kind of trapezoidal transitions. Um, whereas the, uh, the internal variable A and 
the request on the channel is driven by the source, which is in the analog side of the simulation. And so we have uh, capacitive charge and discharge um, transitions for those two variables. Any questions? All right, well, that's the end of the lecture. Uh, we can go ahead and try to implement this on your side. I will be here to help uh, as need be. If you guys still need help setting up tools, I can help with that as well. Again, this lecture will be has been recorded and it will be posted on the website. Um, you you should see next to the slides uh, for the lecture. You should see a label called video. The lecture from so yesterday's uh, sorry Monday's lecture has already been posted. So you've introduced three languages so far. Yep. Communicating hardware processes. Yep. Uh, handshake expansion. Yep. And then production rules. Yes. Then, what does the S in PR stand for? Uh, production rules set. Production rules set. Okay. And that's in roughly uh, decreasing order of, of abstraction. Yes. And uh, then that begs the question of why? Why the three levels? Why do we have so far we've only been writing? PRS, mm -hmm. but we have representations that we've looked at in two other levels. So uh, really, ideally, you'd want to be able to write cell time circuits in a control flow language that has a high level of abstraction. So you'd want to write them in CHP. Um, and then there are formal methods for converting that specification down to a set of production rule bodies for implementation. Uh, unfortunately, those methods haven't been automated, and so we're kind of forced to be operating with production rules directly. Um, there is a, a good chunk of those methods implemented in a, in a couple of projects. One is called Petrify from, um, uh, I think it's Greece, and then another is called uh, Haystack, which is a project that I worked on. So these really you only have to deal with these low level low levels of abstraction because the tools don't exist well enough to operate at the higher ones yet. But it's very useful to be able to think about the circuit at the higher levels of abstraction first, um, to, so that you don't have to make all of your design decisions at once. So this is a very simple circuit with the three inverters, simple as possible asynchronous circuit. And it seems as though it has a very direct translation from the uh, uh, higher abstractions to the lower abstractions. Right. What would be the sort of things that we'd encounter that uh, would trip up that seemingly clean process from one to the next? Um, the biggest thing that you'll run into is that when you define, when you write a circuit specification in a control flow language, you can create states um, that are separated by the fact, by the control flow syntax, but not, but don't have a, uh, don't have a unique state encoding uh, that is as a result of the signals you've defined in the circuit. And so you need to insert transitions and wires and variables in order to differentiate states that are conflicting in their current state encoding. And that process is, uh, as far as I know, at least an NP complete problem. So we make the transition from higher abstraction to low level abstraction. Uh, there are 
multiple possible implementations effectively yes. of a higher level specification. And something has to make that choice currently. Uh, it's a mixture of humans and machine making that choice. Yes. Uh, so they may be a very high level for software folks. Um, if you're in a managed runtime, managed memory runtime environment, uh, ultimately, you're actually allocating some bits of memory someplace at some index. The compiler is making that decision for you, but it can make the decision in many different ways. Correct. You only see the high level specification, multiple possible implementations. This is a, another kind of high level spec, low level, multiple possible implementations. So, yes, but it's worse than software um, because not only are you deciding where to put um, transitions to uh, create unique state encodings. You're also deciding things like uh, the encoding that you're using to communicate data. You're deciding um, the uh, kind of more detailed level of the synchronization behaviors between channel actions um, on the external interfaces. You are uh, able to kind of add shared variables between the processes if you need to. You're deciding uh, the specifics of the uh, kind of order of operations inside the process in order to uh, kind of walk the uh, design space between energy savings and throughput or latency or, all, or any other thing that you might want to optimize for the circuit. Right, so there are a lot of different there are a ton of different design decisions that you're making down the line as you go from CHP down to PRS. Yep. Yep.